Um, Alistair, thank you for making the time for us um, today. At Heart of Football, we really tried to get into African Cup of Nations and we couldn't miss all of the content you've been putting out. Um, but first and foremost, I want to start with how did you get into African football? Why, why African football? What connections do you have and how has it developed for you? Yeah, so so I was, I, I'm, I'm from Africa. So I was born and raised in Kenya. Um, uh -huh. so I, I grew up there and I lived there until I came to university uh, in the UK. So I've been in the UK since since uh, coming for university. But that's where my connection has come from. I've always been super passionate about sports and, and particularly football. And that's why I grew up playing and I grew up playing it in Kenya. Um, and, and so then when I wanted to do sports journalism and when I kind of I was working previously in a kind of different field. And then when I decided I wanted to finish that and do something I'm a lot more passionate about, kind of this the sports journalism kind of covering African football is kind of the meeting of all the worlds that I am passionate about um, you know I love yeah. football I love niche football I love African football and, and I love Africa and it's a chance for me to kind of try and represent the continent and kind of talk about it in in, in hopefully mainly positive ways um, and yeah so that's kind of where I decided to come though and it kind of from more professional basis as well you know it's just in such a well I mean you were talking earlier about finding it difficult to get work in sports journalism and in, it's particularly mm -hmm. in the UK it's such a saturated market um, but there there mm -hmm. there isn't as much coverage as there perhaps should be in, on African football so it's kind of fun to be covering what's particularly here in Europe will be considered more of a niche um, and so I, I really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah it's, it's funny it's interesting you mentioned that because we we, we wrote a, an article one of our guys Jack wrote an article about the fairly poor to, mm. to put it kindly, coverage that Sky Sports have, have put out of the tournament, despite buying the right, as far as I understand, they bought the rights to cover all the games, and it's been quite hard to find the games, and the, they started off with only one commentator for some games, and they hurriedly brought in a second, but I mean, you can you tell us a little bit about what your experience has been of coverage from broadcasters or, or mainstream media of the tournament? Yeah, so so actually, when when we found out Sky was going to be covering it, it was actually there was like a lot. Of, it was really great. A lot of good people were really excited about the news because generally, mm -hmm. African nations in Europe particularly gets covered by things like Eurosport, um, who don't yeah. always show all the games. The coverage isn't amazing, um, and so you know when we were trying to kind of waiting to find out who would be the one broadcasting it and then we found out sky would be doing it and then bbc would also be doing the last kind of quarterfinals on we we're actually really excited because it was kind of like oh this is fantastic you know there's going to be a real up <laughs> upping of the quality um and as well as the, of the kind of broadcasting so you know we a lot more people will be able to watch it in the uk because i mean the uk is massive diasporas it has massive footballing community so i think it's you know, it's a tournament that that you know should be really well broadcast here in the UK. Um, but then, so essentially, what happened, I think, was is that Sky decided rather than using any of their own production, they were just going to use the the kind of CAF feed. So CAF, the Confederation yeah. African Football. So they they produce their own feed, um, and and they do it for all their game, World Cup qualifiers, champion CAF Champions League, CAF Confederations Cup, you know, CAFCON qualifiers, uh, and it's you know these same group of you know five or six guys who do single commentary um usually from like one or two camera angles it's not super in depth um and yeah and so as soon as well for, for those of us who've kept up with you know particularly the most recent world cup qualifiers as soon as we heard the commentary we immediately knew oh this isn't actually sky this is sky just kind of slapping their right. adverts on kind of the world feed um and that's why you get all these crazy things like you saw them showing the lineups for certain teams and it's got them all out of position and it's a five five zero <laughs> formation whatever else it is you know so it's so that was the thing is it was like it was really disappointing because essentially sky just bought the rights and didn't do anything with it um but mm. fortunately so many people complained um that sky was kind of forced to do, do their own stuff and bring in you know their own commentary teams and and so that that was really good because it really uplifted it um a having kind of the quality of of sky's commentator but also having two i mean doing single commentary I have so much sympathy because it's such a difficult job um yeah, yeah so so I think that's where they, they've improved uh, I think it's still really frustrating for us because it's like you know there's so much to be done here you know like you know mm. I I would be willing to go on and do pre-match halftime post-match you know like right, you know you and 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 you'll find thousands of people in London 
um, you mm. know, who would be happy to do that and know, have the expertise. So I think that's what was really frustrating for us is it was like, you know, even though we have the, the feed in, in the UK, I still have friends who are looking for dodgy streams of, you know, the, the broadcasters yeah. in South Africa or, or wherever else because they want actual kind of punditry or even I was talking with someone they said they got the German feed and they're like well I didn't even understand the German feed but they had <laughs> pundits they had commentary teams they had you know they, they were giving it the full thing so it was much more yeah. enjoyable um yeah so I think it's been really disappointing for us being like why is there no analysis why is there no punditry yeah and it's particularly somewhere like London in the UK like you have so many former professionals who played in the continent you have so many you know to, uh, journalists and experts um so it is frustrating um, but yeah, so ho hopefully, you know, they, they heard us complain about the, the, them using the world feed and the, that commentary team. So hopefully they'll kind of start upping it and maybe next by next time in the next AFCON, they'll actually be giving it kind of, from our perspective, the, the respect that it's due. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I sincerely hope so. I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons why we were so interested to start learning more about AFCON was because we had to learn about it and that it kind of proves the point the appetite is there definitely i 100 i agree with you it's it's very interesting to hear i mean not being based in the uk it's very interesting to hear that there was at least some reaction to the outpouring we i mean i was infuriated because i thought well, look I just let me learn mm -hmm. just give me something yeah, give me a, a basic so that's that's a positive sign i guess at least um also, I wanted to ask you about the um, the the work you're doing on the podcasting um, on the whistle. Um, were you there from the beginning? Did you help start up on mm -hmm. the whistle? Did you join in? How how was your journey with the platform, and what does it do, and where do you see it going from here? Yeah, so so the on the whistle is is a podcast that I I, I associate produce. Um, it's a podcast that essentially covers all things African football. It's quite long form. Um, so it does mm -hmm. a lot of longer form interviews. You know, we we do, done stuff with kind of bigger European based footballing players, you know, like Kanu, talk to Xabi Alonso and, and, you know, kind of bigger players. But our real passion is kind of African football. So we talk to a lot of, you know, managers and owners of football clubs in Africa, mainly South Africa. So I, I wasn't there when it started. So it was started by a couple of guys um, from South Africa, Zane Nabi, uh, who works at CNN, and another guy, Courtney Fries, who used to play professionally in South Africa. Uh, and then they've kind of just expanded the team. So I joined maybe six or seven months ago. Um, and okay. so we've, yeah, so we've been expanding ever since. We have a couple other guys who join in, a guy called Francis and Quine, who's kind of based in Cameroon and is a Cameroonian expert, and another guy, um, Ahmed Yusuf, who, who's an Egyptian football expert. Um, yeah, so it's kind of we've we've been expanding it. So yeah, so it's a it, it, yeah, it's a podcast that's all passionate about bringing, it's particularly stories. That's our our thing is it's really storytelling yeah. um, and trying to tell the stories of of African footballers from the lens of Africans as well, not from the outside. Um, so yeah, so we're we've been doing that for I think we're there there we're into our third year. Um, though I've only been with it for six months, and we've done various things, we're partnering with other organizations to to produce it and things like that but we're, we're still in the process of expanding we're still quite a small kind of podcast in terms of reach um but we're we're kind of yeah. making inroads and, and you know we've really enjoyed covering the afcon perhaps a bit more than we we would have normally because you know for us you know it's all not it's not you know we're not it's not our day job or anything so it's all of us just yeah, doing, yeah. doing this as our kind of passion outside of our, our day jobs yeah that's 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 great to hear i mean it's um I think the the niche market is one like all different niches that you can find around the world are, are, are fascinating. I I moved to Russia over a decade ago, and I wanted to learn about Russian football in English language, and there were only two websites that did that. Um, really, only one of them still runs properly. Mm -hmm. um, so I fully understand the 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 appeal of the niche market. So it's, it's brilliant to hear that, and especially that you've got a good team, you know, to base around it. So what, what do you hope to achieve with On The Whistle moving forward? Do you want to focus more on, uh, a bit more on club, African club football perhaps, or is it just it just carry on going as you are? Do you have any big plans in the near future? Yeah, so so we, we do do stuff quite a lot with African club football. That That's particularly what I'm passionate about is kind of focusing football that's based on the continent. So, you know, last year we... We interviewed a couple of times Pizzo Mosimane, who's the kind of manager of Alakli, which is kind of the biggest club in Africa, the most successful mm -hmm. club in Africa. And they, they won the last two CAF Champions Leagues. 
Um, so we, we really enjoy focusing on that kind of side of things, um, particularly with him, because, you know, he's a lot of connections with with people from the on the whistle team from because he's he's South African originally. Um, and he used to work for Mamelodi Sundowns, who are, you know, the most successful team in South Africa at the moment, um, not historically. Uh, yeah. So so we so that is our kind of passion is telling the stories of stuff that's going on on the continent. So there's a lot of that is club football. We also try and do stuff covering a lot of the women's side of things. So I. There's a couple of podcasts where I talk about the, the CAF Women's Champions League because that was mm -hmm. hosted for the first time um, in November, I think, or December. Um, so that was really exciting to, to kind of cover and look at, um, as well as kind of interviewing. We've interviewed the, the coach of the uh, South African women's team and, uh, and a few mm -hmm. others. So, yeah, so it's kind of trying to cover as much content from from African football. We're, we're trying to expand, obviously, because of Zayn and, and Courtney, are, you know, they're from South Africa. That's where a lot of our connections have been. So we've done a lot of really Southern African stuff. So. You know, mm -hmm. some of the people at the AFCON, we've interviewed people from Malawi and Zimbabwe multiple times. Um, so we're trying to expand. And that's partially why I've been brought in to kind of bring a bit more East African focus. So that's where we're going. We're trying to focus to broaden our horizons to, to other parts mm -hmm. of African football um, rather than kind of where where kind of the roots are in, in Southern Africa. It's, it's, it's generally astonishing to find a platform that really does cover that breadth of, of African football. I mean, a, a, the, the limited exposure I personally have had, and I think probably a lot of others as well, is for computer games, um, football manager, championship managers, where basically 90% of my football knowledge came from. And Absolutely. I always look for um, African leagues, and to my knowledge, it certainly always used to be, and possibly still is, I believe only the South African League is one where you can, you can find out about it. I mean, there's no denying that the database of players not necessarily the IE test, the passion, but at least the knowledge base is 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 huge. Um, I think that would be a real a real bonus. I would love to see more of that to help engage more people. But um, okay, Alistair, how about let's focus more on the the tournament itself there uh, at the moment. The we spoke to Uri Levy, an Israeli yeah, journalist excellent. who's covering Afcon. Have you come across? Uri? Yeah, yeah, Uri's great. He really knows the stuff. Yeah. I've, Oh, he's a, uh, he's a fantastic guy. And it, we asked him to give us just his preview, his his rundown on what to expect. One of the things he highlighted, which I didn't really expect, actually, was how the really big name stars in the European context, the stars who play for the biggest clubs in the Champions League, the UEFA Champions League, tend not to always star in AFCON. Um, and he, he gave the example of the the player of the tournament for the last 10 years or so. And the list of names is not one that a lot of people in European football would be familiar with. Have you been surprised or is it what you expect that, I think it would be relatively safe to say that the likes of Mares and Mane and Salah have not quite dominated the tournament like European-based fans might expect them to. Have you been surprised or is this, is this what you expect? Yeah, I think I totally agree with Yuri. Like, the, yeah, there's particularly coming from the outside, there's always an assumption these guys play in the best leagues in the world, uh, and they're therefore they're going to dominate in in the ways which they do, you know, on in the Premier League or La Liga or wherever. Um, mm. And and the reality is, it, is it's such a different tournament. Um, you know, you're playing on very different fields. It's a very different pace of game. Um, you know, mm. it's not quite the same kind of speed in which you get in kind of European football, particularly kind of yeah. English and German football. Um, and, and yeah, so the pitch is playing to the style of football. It's also much more physical um, as, mm -hmm. as a style of football. And, and so, you, so yeah, you see, you see players that, that don't try. I think one, you know, perhaps the biggest one this tournament was a lot of people who are fans of the Premier League are saying, you know, oh, we can't, we're so excited to see Saeed Ben Rama play for Algeria. You know, he hasn't played that much. Why has he not played that much? He's been so unbelievable for Brentford and for West Ham and stuff. But but because, you know, and Ben Rama has been all right for Algeria, but it's because he's sitting behind Yusuf Belali, who's, you know, who people in the UK in particular really have never heard of. You know, he plays in Qatar. He used to play in North Africa. You know, mm. why why would he not, you know, he barely, he played in France for just a little bit, but then was banned. You know, why why would he you know, be the one to thrive. But, you know, if if you've watched Algeria over the last few years, you know, even with Riyad Mahrez on the side, Belali has probably been their best player. You know, he's been an unbelievable talent. He's been superb. Yeah. And yeah, if you talk to Algerian journalists, they'll say, yeah, Mahrez has been excellent, but Belali has probably been the best player. Um, and, and, you know, it's that kind of thing where it's, you know, a lot of these teams, 
you know, th th we'd like to think they base their teams around the, the superstars. And oftentimes they do to their own uh, demise. You know, that's been a big problem for Egypt over the last few years is that yeah. they have, you know, arguably the best player in the world right now, Mohamed Salah. But because they try to play through him so much, they try to play exclusively through him. It means, you know, suddenly you're killing the talents that are also in this Egyptian side, you know, Omar Marmouche and Mustafa Mohammed, you know, Mohammed Sharif before, you know, these guys are all really, really good players in their own right. But they, because this team is kind of built off this pressure to play through Mohammed Salah. And, and, you know, in some ways you can understand that because you know, he's one of the best players in the world, but it's really been to their detriment. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That the Afcon is, is is a tournament where you know you expect the unexpected, but one of the things you ex always expect is is you know at least some of the European big guys to really struggle, and we've seen that. You know, Mares had a really poor tournament. Sadio Mane has really struggled. Uh, yeah, you know, Mohamed Salah has, has been all right, but hasn't really kicked on. You know, that the stars have not been the ones in which we would expect. Yeah, it's it's. It, it, I'll be honest. I've been guilty of that exact assumption that you mentioned. Oh, well, we all have. <laughs> you know, they, they 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 play so well in the Premier League. They'll stroll through Afcon, and I'm I'm pleased. I'm slowly opening my eyes to this. I would like more people, hopefully, to to do the same. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I mean, they, we could be here all day going through the utter insanity of things that have gone on this tournament. Um, so, I mean. If you could, I mean, this is a really hard question, really, but if you could distill your three highlights, personal highlights, for whichever reason you choose, um, what three things have stood out for you this tournament so far? Either crazy moments or brilliant moments or disappointing moments. What, what stands out for you as characterising the tournament so far? Um, <laughs> that's, that's a very a good question. Well, I, I think... You know, one of the big things coming into this tournament that everyone needed to be aware of, and I don't think people were quite kind of particularly from the UK were kind of really, really clued in, was how affected the preparation for the tournament was. Um, mm. Particularly, you know, you had a lot of COVID outbreaks for a lot of these teams, but the big one yeah. was was player was was clubs in Europe releasing players so late because um, you know pressure from the European Club Association, um, you know, meant that they only released players I think on the third of January, just six days before the tournament started. Um, and, and I mean, and, and then in the end, a lot of those players are the ones who brought COVID to the squads. And so I think people were really kind of disheartened when the tournament started so slowly. You know, I think with the mm -hmm. first round of matches, we had like nine one nils and a couple nil nils and only the first game actually had more than one goal. Um, but it was it, that's exactly what we should have expected, because, you know, you're essentially throwing in 24 teams into a tournament. Most of them haven't even played a warm up friendly, you know, like that's, you know, to think of. Yeah. Say England going into a World Cup having not even played a single friendly would be outrageous um, to expect us to kind of do well. So, so it's been it's been like that. Um, I think so. That's been one. I think the other thing that I've really enjoyed about this tournament is it's been the tournament of kind of the underdogs. You know, we've seen some yeah. of these huge teams really struggle. Algeria, Egypt have been really poor. You know, Ghana were were awful. Nigeria, you know, despite having a brilliant start, got knocked out last night. Um, and it's really been the ones who have who've come in kind of really really well prepared that have done the best um, and I think that's something that particularly for us looking from the outside it's a, it's a surprise when you see oh well, how are Comoros getting through how are Gambia getting through how are Malawi getting through you know it's crazy particularly some teams like like say for instance Malawi you know you have the bulk of their players play locally or in South Africa the Malawian mm. league hasn't even run for like over the last couple of years for a long periods of time because of COVID but it's because these are the teams that are really, really well prepared. You know, I, I love looking at Comoros as an example. You know, this is a team yeah. that wasn't even recognized by FIFA until 2005. I think they won their first competitive match in 2016. Um, but but the reason they're here is because I think it was in 2014, their coach, Amir Abdu, took over. They rapidly professionalized everything. They mm -hmm. built a squad. They targeted bringing in the diaspora of players in France. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if you go on Wikipedia and you look up, Comoros and you look who are their 10 most capped players they're all players who are in the Comoros squad here at the AFCON um, and yeah. I just think that's amazing and it's such a testament to them you know a team full of lower league French players are suddenly beating Ghana getting through to the knockout stages etc but it's because they're the teams that are really really well organized and I think that's been something that I've really enjoyed watching is the teams that have put in the work over the last few years really thrive yeah. the teams that haven't your Ghana's your Nigeria's um have really really struggled i'm trying to think of a third thing that's really defined it for me um 
Yeah, I think I think the third thing that I really enjoyed is is the quality of goalkeeping. You know, traditionally, yes. goal, goalkeeping in Africa has been one of the kind of more, you know, disregarded things. Um, you know, African goalkeepers have always been perceived to be quite far behind uh, the rest of the world in terms of their quality, but also, you know, they're seen as quite chaotic. Um, mm. And and we've seen this tournament that actually. Africa, the, the standard of goalkeeping has been magnificent and I, ironically not from the keepers we expect so you know going into the tournament goalkeepers wise we'd be focusing Edward Mendy obviously uh, and Andre Onana coming back you know yeah. two of the best goalkeepers in the world but Onana has actually struggled this tournament and you can see he's really rusty you know which makes sense he hasn't played in like a year um, but it's been the Mohamed Kamara's of Sierra Leone yeah, yeah. you know the, these guys, you know, the Ben Boinas of, of the Camaros, you know, these are the guys who stepped up and have been brilliant. And I think that's why I really enjoyed this tournament is seeing goalkeepers thriving and in really different ways. I mean, Mohamed Kamara has shown, you know, I've never seen such a Neuer like goalkeeper. You know, he's just <laughs> yeah. constantly out of his box, but, and, and it looks really chaotic, but he's judged everything perfectly. He always gets the ball, you know, he's, he, he hasn't got it wrong yet. Um, and it's a shame he's still not in the tournament because, you know, I would have loved to keep, keep watching him, but yeah, I think, that's been another thing and I really enjoyed the performance of goalkeepers, particularly from the, the smaller nations. Even I look at Ethiopia, their goalkeeper Shanko wasn't the best in nets and, and Ethiopia have traditionally uh -huh. struggled in goalkeepers, particularly over the last years, but his distribution was, you know, elite, you know, incredible 60 yard balls pinging, you know, stuff you would expect from your Edersons, your Allisons, you know, top, top level, yeah. you know, modern European style goalkeepers are kind of, players based out of Ethiopia are playing the same way. And I, I've really enjoyed that. I, I completely agree with you on that. We we were fascinated by Mohamed Kamara. He just he he just he just stood out. And they the first the first round of games, like you mentioned earlier, I believe I'm right in saying it was one of the lowest scoring or possibly the lowest scoring first round of group stage games ever in AFCON of one goal on average per game. So the goalkeepers, you'd imagine, okay, sure, they're going to shine. But seeing seeing that, that was one of my personal favourites as well, was seeing Mohamed Cameron shine out of, for me, out of nowhere. Never heard of the guy. And now suddenly, for me anyway, I'd, lo I'd love him to become a global superstar. He probably won't quite get that far just yet, but at least his name is there. Um, no, I, I love those points. Um, I, I think, I think um, we can't really avoid some of the slightly negative side of things, which we, we, you touched on earlier about the coverage. One of the things that I have really been, I can't say I've been infuriated by because I don't have quite the same depth and length of time of you know, passionate following of African football as you have, but it has infuriated me. The, the stereotypical negative tropes that have been trotted out by all the European clubs about... I mean, the Jurgen Klopp quote before the tournament, oh, this little tournament that he claims he was he was misquoted. And I, I've watched that clip back a few times and there's no way that he was not being disparaging about the tournament, in my view. Mm -hmm. Have you been, how disheartened have you been by the reaction, the preview to AFCON? Is it just the same old story? Um, I mean, taking the uh, Gianni Sikowski refereeing moment uh moments i should say um and then the reports from going to hospital for dehydration i mean to sum it up then how how disappointed have you been or have you been disappointed by the negative reaction of european clubs and fans or are you just sadly used to it yeah there's kind of an element of both like i mean it's mm. been disappointing seeing the kind of coverage that that happens when when you know say for instance what happened with Jenny Sakazwe when he, you know he made those mad decisions calling full time twice you know before full time should have been called um and yeah ob obviously that's going to make headline news because it's it's breaking news it's something that's crazy happen um and and yeah. it's real but but I think yeah what I find disappointing is that you then the the context is eliminated you know the reporting of him yeah, having heat stroke and being taken to hospital, you know, that's not really dwelt on. It's the fact that, you know, oh, this only happens in AFCON. This is crazy. When, you know, yeah, yeah like it's happened, you know, last year it happened in, in a game in Sevilla, um, you know, and it's it's happened, yeah. you know, and it happens. Um, and and that w which I think it's really important not to, to kind of bite back in the sense of blind, you know, commitment to what's happened in African football. I think, we, I think it's really mm -hmm. important to be critical of, 
CAF of FIFA of the organizations yeah. running African football because there are huge problems, you know, and refereeing is one. I mean, but I would say, you know, refereeing is a huge problem everywhere. I think if you look in the UK in particular, it's gonna it's a massive problem. You know, it's been well known for a while that the standard of refereeing in the Premier League has been pretty abysmal relative to its past. And you know, there's a huge refereeing shortage. And so, you know, like I think it's important not to to not to forget that. But yeah, so it's I think it's really important to stay critical of these institutions, particularly mm-hmm. the, the institutions who have the power and the ones who are making the decisions that are ultimately hurting the players and the fans. Um, but I think that what frustrates me is when there is this coverage is it's not, oh, CAF have made this mistake or FIFA have done this thing that's really negatively mm-hmm. impacted African football. It's, oh, this is African football. This is what it's like on the continent. This is, you know, and, and so I think that's what's really damaging is it's, you know, absolutely, we need to be really, really critical. Um, and that's the kind of way in which we improve things and we keep institutions to account. But it's when yeah. it's, we're just throwing that kind of brazen insults at place. And that's when it's really frustrating because that's when you feel there's these, these undertones of whether it's racism or colonial and attitudes, you know, this is, this is bad. You know, the Africans can't run it themselves. They're doing a bad job. You know, this is what African football is about is chaos and mess. It, and, and, you know, and it's really, it is, it is disheartening that that's the coverage, but it, it's, it's not surprising. Um, I think, I think for me coming into this tournament, I think if anything, there's, there's been a lot to take heart from because I'm seeing a lot more mm-hmm. of, of particularly like the diaspora in, in countries like the UK really standing up. Um, and, you know, being, you know, say, for instance, with Sky being incredibly critical of it, being like, this is incredibly disrespectful. This is a major tournament, mm-hmm. you know, arguably, the, you know, the third biggest football tournament in the world behind the Euros and the World Cup. You know, the Copa America is obviously is its own amazing history. And, you know, I wouldn't want never want to compare, but the cat, you know, particularly in, to a British audience, the, you know, a cup of nations is huge um, be, because of, you know, the, it, it's connections to the continent and so I think that's what I've really enjoyed is seeing a lot of people are really standing up really wanting to push back um, against those narratives um, and I think that's what's really important is it's kind of pushing back against the narratives but not doing it in a blind way you know for me there is that temptation to be like oh you know this happened to Sikazway but this happened to this you know Graham Paul made an idiot of himself in the World Cup when he booked the same yeah. three times you know and there's that, that temptation just to, to bite back and to fight back um and I think there's an element that's absolutely we need to push back. And, you know, that's, you know, for all of us, particularly in the media, that I think I see that as part of our rules as it kind of almost from mm-hmm. p- perspective of justice. You know, we need to give a healthy representation. We need to provide yeah. the actual context for thing. But it's really important not to do it in a blind way and a way in which we're blindly committed to whoever it is, yeah. whether it's, you know, Patrice Mozzepe who, who runs CAF or it's, you know, ultimately Gianni Infantino who runs FIFA who, it seems to have an, an inordinate a, a kind of amount of control over African football. Uh, it's really important not to blindly follow these people. But yeah, I mean that's that's a long winded way of saying I'm disappointed but not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, you you explain it very 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 well there. I mean, I admit I probably was guilty earlier on in the tournament by just listening exactly those examples you mentioned. The referee in Seville was it this last year? I think it was in the Graham Paul incident. And and I and I even when I typed it, I, there was a part of me that thought, you know what, am I just am I just blindly defending it without defending it in the right way? And I, I think it's a very good point you make to be critical, but also be fair. Mm-hmm. As in, not just you know look at look at where else has also had problems, but also admit the problems that do exist. They do exist elsewhere too. Um, the uh, as I wanted to ask you about the the format of the tournament um, mm-hmm. as well because the twenty four team tournament. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. It was the last edition when it was the first twenty four yeah. team tournament. Yeah, yeah. has that been a successful time. move in your opinion? Um, basically, making it effectively half the continent in the finals is that a positive move for for Afcon? Because um, we've seen a lot of reaction in other. Um, confederations in Europe especially um, where people are saying well this is diluting the quality you're letting anybody into the finals Mm -hmm. what about AFCON do you think it has been a positive step I I, I think it has and I think this tournament is the perfect example for that you know in 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 confederations like you know UEFA or Common Bowl you know in South America yeah I I can see the frustration of, of a lack of of you know quality dilution but that's because the power in those 
you know, continents is incredibly focused on a few countries, you know, in UEFA, you know, you, you know, which, you know, of the five countries are going to win in, in, you know, in South mm. America, it's, you know, more restricted even too, but, you know, with, the, you know, the occasional exception. So where, whereas in African football, you know, you see, you know, there's a huge variety. I think in the last three African nations, there's been three different teams on the podiums um, or, um, by, by, for each one. So like nine different teams yeah. have been in first, second and third in the last three editions. So, you know, there is huge amount of competition at the tournament. And so I, I think, and we've seen that we've seen that in this tournament you know we've seen that you know the biggest teams the ones that would be coming with the perspective of why do we need 2014 why don't we just do 16 they're the ones who are being punished um and so i think absolutely i think it's a great thing i think it's it's as well as it, it really really dilutes the amount of power countries have because suddenly you know you have countries that wouldn't normally be able to get into a cup of nations because they would be in a group with one of the big teams and suddenly they can get into it and they can actually show what they've got about them um, so I think I think it's been brilliant, particularly in a continent that is so big with so many countries. I think it, it demands to have that many teams. And, you know, yeah. we, we've really we know we've really not seen any countries really come in like in those two years massively embarrassed. And so I think the, probably the closest was Mauritania this time, you know, losing four nil and two nil and um, one nil. But um, but even that, you know, it's it's you know Mauritania their accomplishment is getting to the tournament I think it's an amazing achievement um and it's brilliant for them and and like yeah but I think in 2019 we didn't really see it and and on the flip side what we have seen is we've seen the deputants have been fantastic so 2019 the one deputant that was there was Madagascar and they mm. they topped their group with Nigeria they beat them they got seven points um they ended up getting knocked out but I think in the quarterfinals um I think they beat DRC as well, maybe. Um, yeah, and then they got they got hammered by Tunisia. But, you know, like, that's an unbelievable story. And then this tournament, you know, the two deputants, Gambia, Comoros, I would throw Equatorial Guinea in there as well because while they're not deputants, the only two other editions they've been in, hosting, they yeah. hosted. Yeah, so they, you know, this is the first time they've qualified. Um, all three of them are into the next, uh, next round. You know, Comoros, they scraped it, um, you know, absolutely in the craziest of fashion. But Gambia and Equatorial Guinea have been incredible value. You know, Equatorial Guinea beat Algeria, Gambia beat Tunisia, you know, so the, these are really seriously impressive, you know, teams coming through. So I, I think the 24, the, I, th I think that argument, and to be honest, I, I haven't seen that argument for this tournament, like I've seen it for the Euros. I, I haven't seen as much complaints about it. Um, and yeah. I think particularly after this tournament, there. I cannot see anyone who would have a foot to stand on in arguing against the 2014 format because it has just proven how how incredibly valuable it is. And it's also shown that the other criticism I think of it is it's like, oh, it's quite boring because, you know, even the big teams, if they lose one game, they're still going to get through. But we've seen this tournament, you know, that that's absolutely not true. The jeopardy is there from day one with, you know, Algeria and Ghana are already out of the tournament. You know, that's so I think that's where we've we've really seen it come to light. So 100 percent, I think the 2014 format is it's here to stay and, and rightfully so. I, I also must must admit, as as a Kenyan, I'm quite biased because it very much opens <laughs> the field of play for us to qualify a lot more than previously. Um, <laughs> but we still we still found a way not to qualify this time. So maybe it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> I I think um I don't know, I think you summed it up very well there. I, I completely agree. I think the it's it's a completely different argument to say 2014 tournament suits UEFA or suits CAF or, or suits another confederation. And I can see already, you can watch this for two weeks this tournament and see the format definitely works. I've, I've never been a fan of the, you know, the best third place teams going through in the past, but it has made, virtually, in my view, virtually every single game uh, worth something. Um, I mean, following yeah. the updated the highest ranked third place exactly. team. I mean, that's a, that's the same thing as getting into the top two to go through. You, you quality, you, you're earning it. Um, I, I, I agree with you completely on that. I hope I do hope the format stays. Speaking of the format or organisation, um, I believe we now know for the next Afcon in Ivory Coast that it will be well is scheduled to be taking place in summer. Mm -hmm. Is this actually confirmed by by the media to your understanding? Yeah, yeah. It um, was there was a media meeting last week, two weeks, two weeks ago, where they confirmed it. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off there. But yeah. yeah. I mean, well, so I mean, honestly, just give me a take. Is that is is that how how much um how much madness does that encapsulate for you? Or does it actually 
Is it just simply bowing to European clubs? Um, should they bow to European clubs um, over this? I mean, I, I read up a little bit just to see what the weather would be like. And um, according to one source, average temperature in Abidjan would be about 32 degrees in June. There's an average of 82% humidity, um, extreme risk of cramp and exhaustion, the heaviest month for rainfall in Ivory Coast is in June. It doesn't sound like a logical time to hold the tournament. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so I think that's the first thing that people really need to understand is, is the climate. You know, the reason Europe always hosts its tournaments in the summer is because that's when it's the best time to play. You know, imagine trying to host, say, the Euros in mid-December, you know, and you've played on Wembley, you know, six times in two weeks. You know, even the best pitches in, in the UK we see in Premier League pitches, you know, say, for instance, Leeds. I think last season, not this, you know, it was swamp at time. So I think it's really important to understand that in the African context, the summer months, the trad European summer months are not a great time to play football um, because yeah. you know, in North Africa, raging temperature, you know, it's so hot. Uh, we saw that in Egypt last tournament, but in, yeah. in sub-Saharan Africa, it's, well, A, because, you know, they're on the equator, the temperature doesn't vary as much. But B, it's the rainy season. That's what really hammers it. So, you know, I, I watched some of the World Cup qualifiers in July in Cameroon. Quite a few took place in Cameroon because a number of countries didn't have um, their own stadiums, weren't kind of didn't pass the regulation test. So they had to play in Cameroon. And it, it was a swamp. It was so hard for them to play. And to imagine you know, the pitches haven't been great this tournament. Um, they vary quite a lot, but some of them have been pretty poor. Yeah. But to imagine that with, you know, huge amounts of rainfall and, and you know it's also really important to understand its type of rainfall is it's not your really kind of dreary British summer winter where it's you know it's just <laughs> raining every day it's miserable it's great it's you know you know my parents who live in, in Kenya a, a couple of weeks ago they had it raining straight for for I think it was three days they had over oh I think they had 24 inches of rain in that time like this is unbelievable amounts of rain and, you know, yeah. obviously with, with things like the climate changing and stuff, it's far more unpredictable. So it's far more harder to manage. So I think it's, that's, you know, the basis of what we need to understand. It's, this is why the African Cup of Nations has always been in January. Um, is it, that is the best time to play. Um, you know, obviously there's exceptions in the continent. You know, it's the weather is very different depending on where you are. But mm -hmm. for the most part, that is the best time. In the same way how in Europe and in, you know, the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere, the best times to play is during the summer months. Uh, I think for, for this tournament, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, because obviously the World Cup is in 2022, th this year is in November, December. Um, and so to host yeah. an AFCON a month after that would be would be madness. Um, and, and, you <laughs> yeah. know, so so for this tournament, absolutely, it makes total sense to move it to the to, to, to the summer months. Um, and, and, you mm -hmm. know, that makes, yeah, exactly. It, that would be crazy from a player's perspective, from, you know, but also from a competition's perspective, you know, nobody would want to watch an AFCON a month after they've watched the World Cup, you know, so, so it's, it mm -hmm. makes total sense to move it to the summer for, for me in that sense. Um, but oh, okay. but th the reason they've done that is not necessarily just because of the World Cup, because we've, from 2019, the commitment was that they would change it every year to the summer. So say, for instance, this tournament was meant to be last summer. It was meant to be in the summer of 2021, which is why it's still mm -hmm. on 2021. Um, so, so that commitment is still there, which I think is, is problematic. Um, abs absolutely. I think it's, it's going to hurt the, the, the tournament, I think, because it's going to make, mm -hmm. it's going to make it really hard to host for countries uh, and it's going to really make it really difficult for fans to enjoy it because it's, you know, everything is just going to be a lot more difficult to run. Will it be more helpful for players based in Europe who play along a certain calendar? Absolutely. You know, you know, they, it'll, it'll help them um, because they won't be leaving their club at whatever. But I mean, from a player's health perspective, it's probably not great for them because, you know, the, the amount of time players get off anyway. Um, so I, I don't really buy it from a player's perspective. From And so so there is this sense it's like, oh, they're just bowing down to, to European pressure. Um, and, you know, that 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 is probably the reality is that, you know, UEFA, the ECA, these these organizations hold so much power now that they can mm -hmm. kind of, even if they do it indirectly or even if they do it unknowingly, they bend these other competitions to their to their will. Um, and I, I think that is poor. I think I think it's not great for African football because once again, African football is taking a hit for the benefit of Europe because European football you know, and, and particularly the major clubs in Europe, they don't get, they don't care about African football. They don't care if there's a thriving league system. They don't care if there's strong teams because all they want from Africa are the players, right? So they, so as long as they've got their elite academies, 
in West Africa or wherever they are, um, and they can bring those kids over when they're 16, 17, you know, they couldn't care less about, you know, say for instance, some of the, and that's partially why some of these teams that are really good at the international level, your Nigerias, your Ghanas, your Ivory mm. Coasts have, have practically non-existent, you know, leagues when it comes to, you know, performance in the Champions League in Africa, the Confederations Cup, is because, you know, the money is not there for them. The money is there for elite academies to produce the talent and then take the talent away. Um, so yeah. I think it's it's more of that. It's playing into the hands of, you know, longer term. I think it's really going to hurt African football. It's not going to encourage this further strengthening of leagues. It's just going to encourage a further kind of Eurocentricity um, centricity to, to the competition. So I, I think it's bad. I don't like it. Um, but I mean, I guess time will tell if how damaging it actually will be. Um, because, because a lot of African countries do play along the same calendar as the European one. Um, so there, right. you know, so it's not like they're, it's not like all of African countries are playing to the uh, kind of the, the calendar of the AFCON. So, you know, a lot of these leagues are still going on. These teams yeah. still have to play on without their, their best players. And that's part of it. And, and so it's, you know, so I, I think for some leagues, maybe it will be better in Africa to, to have their players getting the summer, you know, will they'll stay with the yeah. team during the season, but, you know, perhaps not, but in the end, I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. I think it will longer term. I think it will really kind of hurt the credibility of, of, of the continent. Yeah. It's um, it, it seems almost in a way uh, it's some very interesting points you made about the I, I don't know why I completely forgotten about the timing of the 2022 World Cup. Obviously, that makes perfect sense this time around. Yeah. But um, it's almost like a lose lose situation. It seems um, in January we are never going to stop hearing. It always, I mean, it seems to be mostly Premier League clubs, but European clubs complaining about losing their players as if the tournament has sprung out of nowhere and they didn't know about it at the beginning of the season. So if it happens in, in European winter, you're going to have complaints from club managers in the middle of the season. If it happens in summer, we're going to see possibly, like you mentioned, the quality of, well, the ability to stay to a tournament, the, the safety of the fans, just that alone. Um, so... Well, we'll have to wait and see how it goes, I guess. Um, OK, uh, so just to, just to finish off then, I'm going to have to put you really on the spot now. Um, yeah. I'm going to give you the hardest question at last. Um, in, I would say, arguably the least predictable tournament, <laughs> you have to tell me who is nailed on to win AFCON oh, this year. Come on, that, who, who are you throwing your weight behind? That is that is tough. I mean... I, when I when I when I came into the tournament, I said my three favorites were Algeria, Senegal, and Cameroon, um, mm -hmm. and I had kind of Mali as as my kind of dark horse as well. You know, Algeria already knocked out, um, so that's, that's not gone well. But of course, then <laughs> everyone who watched the group stages would have been like, "Oh well, Nigeria are gonna get to the final. Whether they'll play Cameroon or Cote d'Ivoire, we'll yeah. see." Suddenly, Nigeria out. So it's oh, I have it, you know, my honest answer would be I have no idea. I think, I think. <laughs> In terms of both performances and kind of capacity to go far, I, I still wouldn't put it past Cameroon. Um, I, yeah. you know, even coming into the tournament, I thought this is not a good kind of Cameroon side. Um, this is not a vintage Cameroon team. But, you know, to be honest, Cameroon won the AFCON in 2017, which I would say with an arguably weaker team. Um, Cameroon, you know, there's certain countries that, you know, I, I would say similar with Tunisia, though not to the same extent, and, and, and Egypt, you know, even if they don't have, the best strong squads they have such pedigree at this turn this level particularly cameroon yeah. um you know they really show up and and, and i think the emergence of abu bakar re-emergence you know he he, he had a really yeah. 2017 didn't didn't make the 2019 squad because um he torn his acl and he kind of has has had to reinvent his career kind of moving out to saudi arabia when he was doing so well in in porto in turkey um so yeah i think him coming back Cameroon being at home I, I think they're the ones who have to be favorites um still still you know and and I think the, the reason I would say this as opposed to even going into knockout stages I wouldn't have backed Nigeria as much and same with Cote d'Ivoire even though I think they've been the two best teams in the group stages just because both of these teams have a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that have been really chaotic you know Nigeria replaced the manager uh, Gernot Rohr just just a couple months or less than a month before the tournament started bringing in you know Augustin Egwavon and they have a lot of problems behind the scenes in the federation likewise in the Ivory Coast there's been a lot of problems behind the scenes Patrice Brunel has come under huge criticism and all you know a lot of people are saying why on earth is he even here still coming into the tournament um, I think before the tournament started he only had one good performance um, you know they when they beat Cameroon in the World Cup qualifying but since then they've been really really disappointing 
Um, so I think I I would still put it I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past Cote d'Ivoire having a similar performance to what Nigeria did last night, um, having not an implosion but coming up against a team that is wily, that is difficult to beat, like Tunisia, and, and really really struggling. Um, so whereas I think Cameroon with the fans on their back with someone who's yeah. got who's proven that he can carry the goal scoring weight and with a fairly well balanced squad i think i think i would still have to say cameron but like you said this is the hardest tournament to decide <laughs> you know I, I wouldn't put it past you know malawi coming and randomly winning you know it's just it's that chaotic and and, and incredibly um confusing so so we'll see yeah i i am um, we, we're running a little uh, predictions game with a, a group of friends in a whatsapp group and um somehow I, i'm actually doing okay at the moment <laughs> but that's only because i've i wouldn't say because i predicted more results correctly but more because i've managed to avoid some of these absolutely catastrophic mm -hmm. upsets that are going on <laughs> i'm not even gonna i didn't i i picked algeria as my pre-season uh, pre-tournament favourites and well like you mentioned Which would make a lot um, of sense <laughs> I, I, I mean it, it, it did and that for me is what I've loved probably if I could sum up in one thing what I've loved about Africon is none of it seems to make sense in a really brilliantly entertaining way as in you try and plan and organise and predict it you're going to get nowhere that's my take on it as a relative newcomer to African football but um, Alistair thank you so much for your time I really massively appreciate it it's been an oh. absolutely fascinating insight into uh, African football um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get this podcast out but we, we'd love to we'd love to have you back on to chat about anything African football in the future um, and hopefully we can learn a bit more and hopefully more people will be exposed and fall in love with African football too so uh, so thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. No, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. And any any chance to talk about African football, I'm I'm there. So absolutely, I'll I'll definitely be coming <laughs> back. Thank, thanks so much. Good man. Good man. All right.